Uh, right, uh, thank you very much, everybody. Uh, it's, it's great to see so many people here um, talking about research. And um, uh, what a great start with Laura's presentation. Um, uh, uh, my name is Mark Radford. I'm Chief Nursing Officer at uh, University Hospitals in Coventry and Warwickshire, but also a Professor of Nursing here at uh, Birmingham City University. And um, I, I want to talk to you today about the scary R word, because I think it's really interesting when you look at how people get into research. And people often think, they look at me and say, uh, one of the questions they have is always, um, gosh, you must have had a great career plan to do all these things. And I'm like, well, no, you just sort of fall into them as you go along. And I'm sort of an accidental researcher. And what I want to do this morning is really give you an overview of the sort of current context of research across, uh, my, well, my view of across nursing and um, allied health professional research but also a view about how did I get into it? What were the drivers for me in terms of uh, understanding and getting involved in the research uh, arena? But also um, how I can take that on and what I've done um, in relation to uh, uh, generating a research uh, benefit programme within our organisation and trying to get as many people as we can involved in this programme. Uh, and also perhaps a view from me really in terms of where I see the future of, of nursing research and what it might do for our, our patients. But, uh, I'll be honest, my, my exposure to research was, was fairly limited, even when I was growing up as a child. If I look back at all of the uh, issues that I saw in relation to research, were fairly limited. And, and some of you may remember the um, research programmes for the Open University in the 1970s. Um, and, uh, and these were the sorts of uh, images that were associated with research within uh, growing up. And uh, actually, there's been a renaissance. Never, ever has there been uh, a change in science and research. It's now really, really super sexy. Because actually now we've got uh, people within the media, we've got Brian Cox, we've got Alice Roberts, uh, pushing back really against some of the sort of traditional views about what science and research might be. Um, and everybody often asks me the question, it's like, well, you know, what did you do your research in or something? And, and I always make up a flippant answer of something like, well, it was halothane uptake in a rat's mitochondrium lip uh, DNA or something, you know, because it was all very interesting, you know. And, and, uh, and I think it's really important to actually say that actually science and research can be really, really interesting and fun. So, as part of audience participation, we're going to have a little test. Right then, let's start. Research quiz. Um, real or not, symptoms of asthma can be treated with a roller coaster ride. Hands up if you think that's a real research programme. Couple of hands, people being brave. You're correct, indeed. Um, a landmark study in 2007 by a Dutch team of Retvald and Vin Beest uh, identified that actually if you were to put an asthma sufferer on a roller coaster and go round on 25 uh, cycles, their symptomology improved significantly <laughs> to the point that actually they reduced the overall requirements of their <laughs> ventilator, uh, uh, sorry, their, um, their inhalers. You ready for the next one? Real or not? You can get an STD from sharing an inflatable doll. Yes or no? People are being a little bit braver now, aren't they? They're thinking, where's he heading for this? And it might not be the crazy, might not be the same. You're correct, indeed. Yes, the, again, a landmark study from the Harvard University, would you believe, in 1996 by Harold Moy and Kleist. The it a randomised controlled trial. Ah, <laughs> No, no, it was a case control study uh, within, in Amsterdam, would you believe? Um, transmission of gonorrhea through an inflatable doll. Couple more. Real or not? Were James Bond's drinks shaken because of an alcohol-induced tremor? Yes or no? No. One yes? It's real, yes indeed. Uh, Johnson et al. in 2013 did a study looking at all of James Bond's drinking habits associated with the 14 books uh, by Ian Fleming and came up with the following conclusions that his weekly consumption was 92 units per week over four times the recommended amount. His maximum daily consumption was 49.8 <laughs> units. He only had 12.5 alcohol-free days out of 87 within the entire book. So they fully expected... Um, and suspect that the famous catchphrase, shaken not stirred, could be because of an alcohol-induced tremor affecting his hands. Uh, BMJ, 2013. Right, final one. The survival time of chocolates on a hospital ward. Real or not? It's real, yes, again. 
fantastic study by Mouled et al. in, in the BMJ. Uh, to, uh, if this was a, a covert observational study conducted in a, a number of major teaching hospitals in the London area where boxes of Quality Street and Roses were distributed onto wards and were covertly observed over a period of time. Um, uh, 74% uh, of chocolates were observed being eaten. The mean time from bo box being put out to being eaten was uh, 254 minutes. Um, confidence interval of 179 to 329. Um, and the survival rates were that actually roses were eaten sooner than Quality Street. <laughs> Um, but actually what they didn't do, and the flaw in the study, is they didn't look at the qualitative detail of which uh, uh, chocolates were left and which chocolates went first. So there's a flaw design in there, which obviously I fed back on. Um, and uh, what they identified is chocolates were primarily consumed by healthcare assistants, nurses, followed by doctors. However, again, uh, a bias within the study is that it was medical students doing this, and I believe that they uh, were the ones who had eaten them all along. Right. <laughs> So it just goes to show that actually science can be, and research can be really quite interesting. So my, my uh, halothane uptake in a mitochondria that wraps up a lip is, is flippant, but actually that's just as important as other stuff that we do. But it just gives you a flavour of it. Well, if we look at nursing, um, and broadly since um, the early 2000s, there has been a bit of a renaissance in terms of the policy that supports the development of, of research in, in this area. And I think it's really important to stress that actually we've come a long way. Um, in the 2001 um, RE research assessment exercise, we were pretty low there in terms of developing um, research. Um, we had significantly less numbers of PhD starters with, uh, compared to other professional groups, etc. Um, and permanent professorial appointments were significantly lower than, than other professions. And I'm, I'm delighted to say that that's increased enormously in that intervening period. But it's what's, what's really interesting for me is this is not just a UK unique phenomena. Uh, we see this globally uh, and, and people often look to the United States for examples where we have the science and development of nursing research has been uh, a significant part from the 1950s onwards. Actually thinking about the research that came out in terms of nursing models was, was innovative in the 50s and 60s. And they face a similar problem uh, uh, in terms of the percentage of RNs with, with doctoral degrees uh, coming out of, of US institutions and, and they are facing the same sort of crisis which is about how do we continually develop and evolve research uh, within our, uh, our, our profession as it were to improve outcomes for our patients well um, there is a policy context in the UK and I, I asked the question to you is about how well is this embedded has anybody ever seen this diagram <coughs> no well, um, this is uh, one of the key outputs from um, the Modernising Nursing and Scientific Careers Programme, which, which highlighted um, a, a potential opportunity for people to go into research whilst remaining clinically active within their role. And that, for me, is fundamental. Um, and, and I dare I say it, that's one of the things that I think medicine got right, which is actually um, being clinical and doing research was critically important in role modelling behaviours out in practice for people to see the benefit of research and also an opportunity for them to go forward. And whilst this policy was actually, I think, groundbreaking exactly where we needed to be, I struggle sometimes to see how this actually is translated actually out into practice within organisations up, up and down the UK. So I did a bit of a bit of a research study last night and I thought, well, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll get some good news stories from the um, evaluation trials and studies from the NH NIHR uh, uh, programme to have a look at um, how many nurses were being awarded grants through that. Because actually it was originally designed to massively expand and open up the opportunities for nursing. So I searched almost everything that I possibly could and found a smattering, really, of, of awarded grants within through this programme. Now, it was great to see that we've gone from one to five over a, over a few years period. But actually, I was expecting an exponential growth and, and seeing certainly that into double figures. So clearly, we've got a lot to do. And if you look at who's running those programmes, they are established researchers in big units, often working um, uh, in, in, in academic work in isolation compared to clinical, clinical areas. So I think there is some, some work to continue doing. But one of the key things, particularly when I first started out as a student nurse, was building research into the curriculum. Um, and it was really important that people at the time were questioning, well, why do a module on, on research methods whilst you're an undergraduate nurse? Because you're not going to have the opportunity to go on and do research. That was the paradigm at the time. But for me, it was more importantly about 
developing the skills and the capability, the understanding of what research can do so you can apply it out in practice. And that for me was a building block. It was a brave decision and I still think it was the right one to, to happen. But actually it was also about introducing it as a, as a potentially viable career to, to others. Um, and it was also about don't be afraid of the R word. Um, and, and it was important to understand that research isn't necessarily scary for people to do. It depends on how you articulate it and how it's organised. Now, as a, as a staff nurse working into, walking into an academic unit in a big university teaching hospital with a professor of medicine doing their highfalutin stuff and all I have to do is take blood for him at the end of the bed, it's no wonder people won't break out of that to think about what does that research mean to them and what could they do with their own programme. And it's also about students doing research. And, and, and it's somewhat sad to see in lots of programmes up and down the country that when I was a, an undergraduate, actually research was a fundamental part of what we did, including doing a, a piece of research or low scale, low scale research within um, my degree um, as an output through the thesis. And that's changed significantly now in terms of the output programmes we see with undergraduate nursing uh, broadly across uh, the UK. But it's also about how often do we get undergraduates and students involved in these sorts of programmes. And I'm delighted here, obviously, at BCU that that's an active part of what we do. But that is inconsistently applied across the whole of the UK when we look at the student population. And what's really critical is unless we start at this very early stage, building the building blocks into people's uh, way of working, it's very difficult to then go on to build capacity, particularly at postgraduate level. Um, um, and it's really important that we use those opportunities to ensure that we can highlight people who have a, a focus or a belief that they would like to go on to do that, but actually they remain in clinical practice to deliver what they need to do. Now, my background in, in research is, like I said right back at the beginning, it was sort of rather accidental. Um, I, was a, I was a theatre nurse for, for many years, and um, I remember when I first joined um, the nursing profession, um, there was a debate raging within the literature, both in terms of research as well as also opinion and documents, that actually you didn't need to be a nurse to work in an operating theatre. It was purely a technical task and nursing was wasted. And, and this used to make me very irritated because actually uh, with unconscious patients or patients who are extremely vulnerable in those sorts of situations throughout the entire perioperative process, they are at their most vulnerable and that's where nursing, I think, can make a significant contribution to the outcomes of their care. Um, and many times when I was a, as a theatre nurse, I, I would sit with relatives who, um, whose patients were on the operating table during a major trauma operation, uh, comforting, guiding them, and also thinking about the onward care that I would need to deliver uh, whilst their patient was in the recovery unit or going to ITU. So I fundamentally saw that. As you can imagine, I was slightly cocky um, and started to make waves about it. And I wrote my first ever article in the Nursing Standard about it, trying to defend nursing by saying actually there was an evidence base around using um, those outcomes in the operating theatre that gave a, a huge benefit. And it became my mission for about five or six years to continually push the idea that nursing was a significant contributor to the outcomes of patients in the operating theatre environment. And I started to then start to look at studies. So my first study started to look at the student's experience in the operating theatre because they were taken out because it wasn't seen as nursing. So I recrafted a programme to bring them back in, to follow the patient journey, to think about the continuity of care, to identify the learning opportunities around infection control, fluid management, hypothermia. Whatever I could identify was brought into this programme. And that was my first outcome that actually I published a study here with uh, one of the lecturers from BCU. And it was important because actually fundamentally for me it was about raising the awareness of what the profession could do. And that led to a range of other potential opportunities right up to, to PhD level um, for me. Um, but actually a lot of people say, oh gosh, PhD, that's quite scary. Um, and it is, yes, absolutely. And, um, but it's doable, completely doable. All of you in this room could do it. It's really fundamental. Everybody every, often thinks that I'm, I felt a right thicko at times during my PhD, and I kept on thinking, gosh, I could never do this. People are far brighter than me. But actually the most important thing was the idea and the passion and the belief that you could go the distance to deliver the outcome that was required. And what was really important is actually I had the idea. It came out of an MSc proposal that I put together as part of an assignment that I'd done as part of an advanced practice course. And I was told it's way too big for a master's programme. You need to cut it down. And I was like, well, that doesn't seem right. Oh, you're going to get stuck with loads of ethics issues. I was put off all the time about not taking it forward. And, and, and generally, I lost will and enthusiasm and the energy dissipated for taking it forward. 
But what changed for me? Well, it was important. It was this crystallisation of thought. Actually, it was still an important question to answer. I was curious. I really, really wanted to understand why nurses and doctors operated the way they did and why there were all of these tensions about making decisions about patients. So I took it on. Favourable conditions at work happened. I had a job with a bit of research in it. Um, I, I fought hard for that. Um, um, I felt like I was getting left behind. I wanted to continue to develop, so it was about personal development for me. And also, I got a monumental kick up the backside by a former um, lecturer here at the university, um, who then went on to be my supervisor. So, you know, sometimes it is a combination of factors, but the most important thing is the idea, the will, the passion, and wanting to be curious about some of these issues. Now, 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 now what about now? So. Um, you know, people also say, oh, I'm in my ivory tower and, and, and I work as a chief nurse and I shuffle paper around and, and organise stuff. Um, um, that's what my daughter thinks I do um, when I get home. What do you do at work, Daddy? I say, well, you move paper around, don't you? Your desk and stuff and, and wander around imperial visits to your wards. Um, and, and, and I'm now, as chief nurse at University Hospital, it's in, in, inherent in me to, to take that passion and enthusiasm and, and deliver it to my team who are out there because I've got 6,000 staff and, and uh, 3,000 nurses and I want each of those 3,000 nurses to be researchers to some degree and I'll describe the way we're going to do that. Now, I, I'm completely objective by, about this but um, I do have the best hospital in the whole of the NHS. Um, <laughs> it is absolutely fantastic. It's 1,400 beds. We're a regional centre for brilliant, uh, all sorts of brilliant special including major trauma. We're a teaching hospital. We have uh, fantastic staff. We do loads of things that are, are brilliant for our people within the Coventry and Warwickshire area. Um, we saw 185,000 people in our emergency department last year. It does sometimes feel like they do all come on one day alone. Um, it, is, it is quite bu busy um, and, um, and we deliver about 6,000 babies. Um, I, I delivered that slide once um, in um, Holland. And I was, trying to be, I was trying to be kind, you see, because sometimes translation doesn't work, and I do talk fast, so I tried to translate my slides into Dutch, um, which I did. Um, and here's a, here's a salutary lesson for you. Don't use Google Translator. <laughs> um, because I put this slide up, and there was a guffaw of laughter across the entire uh, room, and, and then somebody came up to me at the end, and they said, do you really post your babies? And I went, post them? <laughs> And she says, yes, the way you've Google translated that means that uh, I said deliveries, babies delivered. And she said, That's, that, that means you pop them in the post. And I said, well, there's a stalk and things and those sorts of things. But anyway, so uh, just, just yeah, so Google Translator, be warned. Um, last year, um, uh, when, when I first started, I, I set out a vision um, within our organisation. that uh, I thought that we had the potential to be a national and international leader in healthcare research and innovation and that wasn't just about the doctors this was about every member of my team being able to contribute to that so our research um, uh, strategy was launched last year um, I'm delighted to see some some members of my team here which is absolutely fantastic um, helping me to <laughs> deliver this program we develop, call it the care program which is the clinical academic research and innovation environment and it's designed to be working collaboratively with um, higher education institutes our staff to deliver the outcomes that we want. So it focuses on the requirement to deliver research for direct patient benefit. It develops an, a, a developmental approach to embed research in every aspect of what we do. It accredits our units to make sure that they are rewarded for the, the outputs they achieve in terms of research and care. Uh, but also prioritises resources because I haven't got an endless pot of money so I want to do things that actually make a big difference to the people I serve within our community but link in with those universities to do it. So this is how the care model works um, and what's really important is there are different levels and the first and fundamental question that we ask everybody about research in our organisation is can you do your job better? What is the information you need available to you to do your uh, job better? And we developed something called CBIS, which is a, a library-based search system. And anybody in our organisation can send a question to the CBIS service, which is a team of researchers who will go away and they will do all of the review for you and come back and answer your question. I have asked one recently about how do nursing rituals um, impact on patient safety around medicines management? They've come back with all of the evidence and what we're going to do is we're going to actually deconstruct a ward. So instead of having drug rounds at 8 o'clock and 12 o'clock and 2 o'clock and 6 o'clock, we're just going to deconstruct all of that and we're going to build it up from scratch based on what the patients want and see whether or not that improves the overall efficiency of delivery but also the outcomes for patients in terms of reduced drug errors. So I, I, we, we, we use that service to do that. 
But it's also about being aspirational, making people want to think about research in their different environments. So we set out a, a developing a research and innovation aspiration, which is that you know at the initial stages, it's about using evidence base, it's ensuring that people are exposed to research on every single ward. So they might be involved in recruiting to trials, they might be involved in journal clubs or mentoring people, but they might be involved in see researchers. And I would say um, uh, every part of our organisation uh, want to be part of our learning culture. But also there are some units that want to go on and start to develop. So we're, we're, we're investing in areas where they start up small scale projects. And that's called a level three accreditation. So I'm looking at 40 areas across our organisation that will do that. So it's about developing and supporting M master students, MRES. It's about output, so conference presentations, publications. So building that capacity and confidence to be able to do what they need to do. A level two unit is, um, is one that's linked to a higher education institute. It might only be 20 areas in our organisation, but it's an area where they're really starting to gear up in relation to delivering outputs in relation to research. So they've got PhD students, they're producing research outputs. They are getting research grants in that are self-generating and developing to keep a research team active within the physical environment as well as also level one units, which are a full HEI, professorial-led uh, unit, uh, sustainable grant income, multiple PhD students, presentations as publication outputs, etc. And what I'm delighted at is actually now we've implemented this, we actually already have uh, at least three uh, level uh, one units in place. We're working on a number of areas at level two, which I'll, I'll come on to describe in a little bit. It's really busy, this slide, so you just when the slides come out, you can just read it, but I'll give you the general overview. But we've looked at what we're good at, and I've looked at what our patients want and what they say is really important to us. And so we've identified some themes around research, which is, which is women's uh, health and maternity, child health, cancer and oncology, older person dignity, dementia, workforce innovation and health technology. And what we've identified and, and worked with with our care units is actually work with HEI to try and build a linked capacity i.e. that we both do those things really well together, so why wouldn't we collaborate? So our nurses, doctors, healthcare assistants, physios, etc., working in those environments get exposed to the right people doing research. So uh, she'll, she'll kill me for doing this, but this is Professor Young. Um, Annie is our um, uh, Professor of Nursing from Warwick University. Um, she has a phenomenal research portfolio in cancer and oncology, and she's a clinical trialist as well. So a nurse who runs clinical trials within a medical school. It's absolutely fantastic role model, and I'm delighted that she's part of our team leading the cancer and oncology arm. Um, we also have um, a, a range of, of early start programmes in, in dementia that we're working with two universities, both Coventry and BCU, in relation to uh, older people. Um, it's absolutely fantastic. The early stages of that, we've got some research nurses that have just been employed on the back of some grant income we've got that are going to be looking at the early start of our programme in this area, which is, for me, fundamentally, where um, I think there is a, a huge challenge looming. There is something about technology. And how do we use technology? We're really good in um, the NHS of just buying stuff off the shelf, sticking it into clinical environments and hoping it works. And, and what's really, really important to me is actually we're really rubbish at evaluation research. Um, actually, we're also really, really rubbish at uh, actually understanding the psychology of how we interact with technology. And I'm delighted that uh, we've just appointed somebody in a research role at, uh, at, uh, at UHCW who's actually doing that within infection control and thinking about um, how, that, how people interact with technology to improve outcomes in things like hand washing, etc. So it goes to show that actually we, we need to think about different areas where we might be involved. And another area which is, I think, really useful uh, is about workforce innovation. And that's about thinking about the breadth of the profession, about how we take people. My, my, my vision has always been that you know, we should have a clear development opportunity for people coming in at a support worker level right through to getting to um, PhD and chief nurses and, and, and professors, etc. It's really important that we use that and build that over time, that people see that as an opportunity to develop and progress. Just to finish on, really, because um, it is a bit of a whirlwind tour of, of my thoughts around research, and, but wh where's the future? And I think my final comments are around that balance between reality and aspiration. And it's also about a message, and the message about being brave, because it is often the case, particularly within nursing, midwifery and allied health profession research, is that we are often not the masters of our own destiny in relation to the research that we would like to undertake. So we all know post-mid staffs, we all know that the media interest in relation to nursing care and care outcomes, to my mind, will drive 
a, a set of research um, emphasis in areas that I think that we've already done. And I think it's going to take a lot of time and energy of the small amount of research capacity that we have in answering questions that we probably have already done, and, and Laura mentioned that. So there are going to be a, a more, more studies looking at care quality and clinical outcome. I'm sure there are going to be 101 new studies now on safer staffing, although the evidence for this goes back uh, uh, decades in relation to, to what we know. There's also something about the professional role of the nurse, care and compassion and what that means. And again, if you look through the literature, d d go into Google but not Google Translate and type in com compassion in nursing in Google Scholar. I mean, you're, you'll have hundreds of millions of hits. So there is something about reprocessing re stuff that we already have. And actually, me, I want to be brave. And I think that we should say we have the evidence base for that and advise accordingly through we what we have. And the two areas where I think are the biggest development opportunities are one that I call fusion research. There are so many opportunities in the sort of work that we do where we can align ourselves with other disciplines, as Laura mentioned earlier, um, in relation to getting the best outcomes. A good one for me is, um, is uh, we're looking at a programme and a project here with BCU about ma using mathematical modelling as a predictor of risk utilising, um, uh, we have a patient um, um, uh, observation system called VitalPack that takes all of this data. And actually, we've got 10 million data sets. What wouldn't be fantastic to develop a clinical mathematical model that algorithmed the potential risks based on the number of set parameters that you, you, the nurses plug into the system? So rather than waiting for the patient to fall or the wait, waiting for the patient to develop sepsis, this system will predict it based upon just simply using mathematical models. Now that stuff's already out there. If you look at banking, they use risk-based algorithms in relation to market trends and how uh, the FTSE works. And they can predict when things will start to slide in different types of sector. So it's out there. It's that sort of fusion that I'm thinking of where we will see significant benefits for developing nursing research alongside other types of discipline. And the other area is, is translational research. Um, and that's getting stuff from the bedside to the bench and back from the bench back to the bedside really, really quickly. So a, a nurse can see what goes on at a ward, an outcome that she wants to answer a question about, about delivering care, whether it's tissue viability, whether it's falls, VTE risk assessment, whether it's catheters. I, I don't mind, but they have access to support to understand those questions. And some of that may be in the new phase, we'll be developing alongside things like genomics, etc., to be able to identify treatments and management that actually can get back to the bedside quickly. Because my fundamental uh, dream is that actually my patients, all 1,400 of them in the beds today and the 690 that will turn up through my ED department today, will have the opportunity to get the best standard of care by our staff being having access to research and using the best evidence base available to deliver the best outcomes that I can. So there is an economic as well as also a clinical imperative to get this sorted because good care costs less. Good care is good care and it's good outcomes for patients. So there is an important benefit fiscally and also uh, from, from a professional point of view in developing this with some urgency to deliver the sort of outcomes that we would expect all of our relatives to, to uh, see within our hospitals up and down the country. So I, I don't want people to be diverted on, on dead-end questions that we've already answered. I want people to think braver. I want think people to step out from the mould a bit to be able to do some of this thing because I actually think that's where the future will be. So I'll finish there and say thank you very much for listening this morning.